uh, we'll be looking at HDRP. Um, when you go into Unity um, and you create a new project, it will ask you one of the easiest ways to, to set up HDRP is literally just to like create a HDRP project. You can add HDRP, uh, you, you can, but it's kind of awkward. It is much easier just to set up a new project that is HDRP. Um, when you set up a new HDRP project, it will ask you if you want a sample scene. Um, you can say yes, and you get this sample scene, which some of you may have seen before. And the sample scene is actually really useful because it kind of just shows you um, what goes into the the creation of a HDRP scene. So it's still baking shaders, so it might be a bit laggy, but um, hopefully it's fine because um, I had to update a few things this morning, including substance. Um, so let's let's do let's have a look at the basic stuff first. So our camera doesn't really change that much. We do have a physical camera, uh, meaning we can either use our usual kind of like FOV axis, like this little field of view slider, or we can use like actual um, a, a physical camera will allow us to uh, kind of like if anyone's done photography before. Um, make it look as if it's, it is like photography, right? So we can literally control the, um, shutter speed, ISO, we can control the aperture, uh, we can control, like, focal length is basically the same as, as field of view, pretty much. Um, anamorphism is how, uh, like, kind of like, it's kind of from movies, um, basically like how, how, like, curved it is almost, and then... The aperture shape controls how, like the what's something called bokeh balls. So like when you look at something blurry, um, what how how to sh like how that blurry shape looks like. Let me see if I can find bokeh. So my comp is not running the best at the moment. So I have like baking shaders and I Photoshop substance on Unity open. So that's bokeh, right? So um, the more aperture blades you have, the more circular the bokeh is. It's like in the out of focus areas, the less um, blades you have, the more sharp it will be. Okay, so that you can use a physical camera or you can use a general camera. So unlike the original kind of like um, image effects, that was the old school kind of way of, cr of creating these effects in Unity, um, HDRP doesn't rely on just image effects on the camera. And the reason for that is HDRP will allow you to have volumes, meaning like uh, in this case, they're, they're all global, so they're affecting everything in the scene, but it can have a volume, which is like only in this box, for example, when the camera passes through that box, it will start using uh, that specific volume. And this this is dependent on created, creating like literally a bounding box. Um, and in that volume, you can tell, let me go to this volume. Within this volume, you can tell it what profile to use. Um, so you can create a new one. Um, this one is like the, the basic sample post-processing settings. So it's just a, a, a profile that's basically like a list of the, here you go, of the image effects that are applied to that volume. Um, and you can, you can add more over here. Um, so you can have, if I right click, uh, volume, and I can do like a box volume, for example. You can see it's a little box, meaning like whenever you go into that volume, I want it to then override. Uh, let's put the weight to, this is one, that post-process volume, this weight is. Uh, oh no, sorry, priority is what I want, not weight. Yeah, priority, let's put that to zero, let's put this priority to one, so this will override. So hopefully, uh, when this, when the camera goes into this bounding box, it will override. Is that in? I'm not sure that's overriding. Uh, it may be because the other one is global, meaning it's going to affect everything. Let me see if I can add a new post-process profile here. And uh, let's just do a really awful... Let's do like a huge film grain or something, so we know for sure. Oof.
Okay, so you can see that, that it's affecting it when I'm inside the volume. All right, so when I move it outside the volume, it should stop affecting them. Um, I don't know this will work very well because it is... It is still baking shaders as well. So, anyway. Um, so, when you create a volume, like, you kind of need... You only need one, really. Um, but if you want a sky volume, you can add a sky one as well. So there is right click volume and you can do sky and fog volume and then either local volumes like box volume, sphere volume. These are all just different, um, shapes and a global volume will affect everything. Um, so this one is a global volume. Um, and as you can see, whatever I add here is being, it's being applied to the entire scene. Oh my, <sighs> I think maybe we should pause for a bit until this baking completes because it's literally like every two seconds. It's almost there. It's 2%. Let me just pause the recording and then we can... Done. Okay, so where were we? Um, yeah, so the post process volume controls the actual post processing effects. The sky and vo fog volume controls like the um, sky and fog. So if I look up here, I don't know if you can see that. If I zoom further away, you see the way there's like a, a density drop? Um, so it looks like there's fog in the way. So that is essentially what the fog does. You can control it so we can make like the attenuation distance. I always never remember if it goes higher or lower. I think it's, yeah, lower. So I can like have Resident Evil style super high attenuation. Um, and we can also change the color of the fog. If I make it volumetric, it means lights should affect it. Now I'm not sure how well it's going to work, but let me try and make a point light and see how well that works. Um, I think I need to add, make this also volumetric. Do, 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 do. Where's my point light? There we go. Oh yeah, you can see it here in the game mode, in the game view. So it doesn't see, is it updating the, I don't know if it updates in scene view. You can see it in, in game view anyway. You can see that there, right? Um, let me add the intensity higher, and yeah, you can shift the color, you can make a light filter color, red, cool, so it's volumetric, meaning like, uh, lights will actually affect it, so if you remember from, um, from actual, um, non-HDRP, if I put a point light there, it would only reflect on the surfaces, whereas in volumetric lighting, um, it will actually uh, affect the fog, so, Having the fog allow volumetric allows that. So if I turn that off, it doesn't. It's just a, a direct fog. Uh, but it obviously costs more, but it allows me to have volumetric lighting. Um, so that's the attenuation distance, volumetric light. We can have like the, um, excuse me, the height, meaning we can control like how high or low the fog is. So I can drop it low. Um, see, so now it's below this platform and I can make it higher so it goes above. So literally I can have it like, um, I can have a mountain range and as I go up above the mountain range that, that fog doesn't affect it anymore. So it does have a height and you can also have a maximum height. Um, and you can control, this is the max fog distance. That's how far away it, it affects, right? So if you're going to do stuff like fog, um, the sky is here and visual environment stuff, you would do it on a sky and fog volume. So don't be confused. Sometimes people, because uh, you can add in the post-process volume, you can add like a sky, a sky and a fog thing here as well. You can add them there. And, and it will work, but it just doesn't quite work as well. Um, I do think it's better. Oops. Let me remove that fog. Um, it, I think it works better on a specific sky and fog volume, like separate them out. It's just for easy use as well, personally. I don't really know why, but um, Unity does it, so I'm going to follow what the Unity sample scene does, right? So you can have a separate volume for sky and fog, and then one for your global. So let's go to the post process. So the post process is very sim similar to, um, excuse me, to basically, let me just double check my recording. Yeah, it is. Um, it's very similar to the image effects once you have it set up. So once you have the post process volume, just right click, create one, um, you'll have this thing called a profile, which I just created one. So you can either create new or edit one that already exists. Um, as I said, you can either click on it and edit it here. So this, this is a profile. Um, any post process volume that's referencing that profile will be affected by that profile. 
So if I change this profile, if I add stuff here, if I have another scene, for example, that's also using that profile, um, it will use that profile. So this is kind of nicer than the old school um, adding image effects on the camera because this means I can just have that profile. I can swap it out even. Like, even in code, I can tell it to swap between profiles. Um, so there's multiple things I can do. So you can see I have like a vignette here. Let's increase that intensity. That's a vignette. Um, we got our exposure. So we're controlling like the, uh, the, the, what you call it? Like how, how bright the scene is. Um, we've got a bit of white balance. If anyone knows what white balance is, uh, white balance is a term from photography. If anyone's done like photography courses or anything, this is quite useful, uh, for these, for this kind of stuff. So white balance is essentially, there is a temperature and the temperature controls like how the scene is rendered. So let me show you what I mean. So this is a good example here. So white light has like a pure, I can't remember what it is, but it's something like, I think it's 5K or something. Yeah, 5.5 to 6.5K. So like that's average daylight. That will be the literally the temperature of the light at its surface causes a color shift. So you know the way like at night light gets a little bluer and a little like it, it's not just a little darker, it's also shifted a little bluer. Um, and in fact like one of the ways that people make a scene look like it's nighttime is they shoot in daytime, then they put a blue filter over it so it looks like nighttime. Um, so a lot of like TV shows would have done that. So that's kind of what white balance will do. So with white balance, I can either tweak it to make it look more like blue or orange depending on what I want to get across. This is slightly different from color grading. So white balance affects the temperature. So let me show you. So if I do that, it now looks a lot warmer. It's almost like this is a desert scene and it's got a really orange, uh, like maybe sunset lighting going on. It's like a, the sun is setting. If I do that, ooh, that's a bit cooler. This is a bit too much. Um, so white balance is usually used to offset like artificial lighting, but in this case, you can use it to kind of like grade. Uh, almost uh, and you can tint as well so not the temperature controls basically orange and blue you can see that going between orange and blue so like cold and essentially desert warm and tint controls between green and purple so you can shift it like so you kind of get like this see it was kind of going greeny properly so if I wanted an underwater scene I could white balance it down a little green and a little blue uh, let's tint it a bit more. And this is sort of an underwater blue-green scene, right? So it looks like it's um, like a quite dreamy underwater kind of thing. So you could you could tweak the white balance to work that way. We just turn off the tint. I think this is on 20. Cool. Uh, chromatic aberration. I'm not sure why they have it on here, which is weird. So chromatic aberration is... that is a good here's a good example basically at the edges of um pretty much every camera that uses a single lens you get this kind of shift where the pixels don't quite align the light coming into the camera doesn't quite align um so you get this chroma fringing All right so it splits the colors into like uh, red green blue does it it's pixels um now this is generally used for like sci-fi games, or if you're looking through a TV, um, or you're looking at a camera, you might whack up the chroma aberration. I don't know if you can see that happening on the sides here. So now it looks like I'm looking through a uh, TV lens, especially if I put some grain on and maybe some filter over the over the camera. That this looks like I'm looking through uh, like a CCTV camera or something like that, right? Um, so I'm not sure why they have it on by default, but it does give that effect. Or you can use it also to if you use it very subtly. Maybe that's what they wanted. If you use it really subtly, it kind of gives you that 80s vibe, um, 80s, 70s, 80s vibe, because it kind of looks like a... Um, sorry, give me a second, I'm getting a phone call. Yeah, you sometimes see that when, the, uh, when you get blurry vision or something. Q 
cool. So let's add some new overrides. So literally just trying to add more effects is just clicking add override and I should be able to choose. So as I said, you can add fog, but I, I think it's better to keep sky and fog under sky and fog volume. Um, but we can add stuff that has to do with lighting. So we've got I'm an occlusion. Um, if people remember that. So let me slap on some I'm an occlusion here. Let's give it some intensity. So I'm an occlusion is basically contact shadows. Um, you can go too far, especially if you're trying to get a realistic look. But let's see. So I up the I'm an occlusion. You can see that like there's a little bit. Hopefully you can tell. Um, on the screen view, there is like contact shadows, uh, which to me makes things look a little more realistic. There's a little bit of like um, depth when things hit. Like, let me go crazy and you should be able to see. So basically anywhere that there is uh, contact shadows or like gaps, um, areas where there is um, items meet each other, like here, should be able to see like so that there is this I'm an occlusion. So I mean, go don't go crazy with it. But a little bit, I do think, works. Um, and then basically, most of the time, whenever you add an overwrite, the intensity is almost always like what controls it. And you can control all the other um, the other stuff individually, but you don't have to. You can, and, and but you don't have to. Um, it will usually use like a default. Uh, the radius kind of expands how, how far this M occlusion uh, works. So this is like screen space I'm in occlusion, meaning it's real time. It's not baked. You can also bake it in the map, but this just works like as a as a direct like AO across everything. Okay. Cool. Let's add more. I've got lighting. We've got screen space uh, illumination. I don't think will work unless I have a ray tracing. Let me check. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't work. Um, so let me remove that. Uh, I need ray tracing. So you currently, if if you're lucky enough to have like a 20 series or a 30 series card, I believe ray tracing does work with them. So RTX, uh, I'm not sure which AMD series work. Um, but if you don't have that, you won't be able to use stuff like uh, like ray tracing or global illumination because they, they rely on... Um, so what ray tracing does is literally like light will be calculated as a bounce so if it bounces off this bounces off this and bounces off something else and then you kind of get your like uh uh you get like your reflections uh base of that like and, and not just like reflection reflections not just like shiny reflections but also reflections in terms of um like color reflections meaning if i put like a a, a red ball here it'll kind of give a red hue to the ground uh it's really nice looking uh but it's also expensive uh let's do SSRR, so screen space real time reflections. That will that work? No, also needs. So we need to use instead these reflection probes, which exist in here. Reflection probes. So let me click on one of them. This is a reflection probe. So what the reflection probe does, it's kind of a fake way of creating reflections. So it's just literally like right click. Uh, I think it is. Where is it? light yeah light reflection probe and what you do is you have a probe it has a volume so you can edit the volume there you can either make it baked or real time so this one is baked right now okay so let me make a 3d object um, sphere and let me just put that sphere here and if I go back to the probe you can see that it doesn't, it's reflecting the table. Uh, actually, let me put the sphere above the table so it's more obvious. You can see that the sphere is reflecting the table but it doesn't see that sphere that I just put in because it was baked. Now, if I set it to real time, which obviously costs more, now it is detecting the um, that sphere. And if I move that sphere IRL, uh, sorry, in real time, it also will affect uh, affect the reflections of everything inside it. So what a reflection probe does is basically it takes this reflection, whatever this probe, uh, this this shiny bit is the probe. So whatever this probe sees, it takes. And then the bounding box is whatever is inside the bounding box will copy the reflections of this probe. So it's a cheaper way of getting like quite realistic reflections. So I don't know if I can, let's see if I can see it here. Will I be able to see it? Don't know if I'll be able to see um, that little sphere reflected in some of these. I probably won't. They're not that shiny. I can see it here. Let me make another sphere that is super shiny, and maybe that'll work. And 
let's give it a super shiny material. Uh, and I'll go over materials in a second as well because they are slightly different. Smoothness high, velocity high. Let's slap that on this thing. Okay, so you can kind of see that it's reflecting itself. I don't know if you can see that because it's this is like myself because it's copying the reflection from the probe. Not It's not actually using the reflection from where it is, if that makes sense. I know it's a bit confusing. So can I make sense? So it's kind of like a camera where the ball in the center is the camera and then the uh, ball, the red ball is the video feed. It's getting their video feed from everything around it. So like the... Yeah, but no, no. Uh, what I'm meaning is the red ball is seeing what the... Um, it's a the TV screen, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's seeing what the middle screen is or the middle ball yeah. is. Seeing. So this middle ball is, is, yeah, is the one that's actually grabbing the info and it's then projecting it to everything within its bounding box volume. So anything within that will use that reflection. So that's why this is using that reflection. So if I move that sphere, for example, this yoke, if I move that away, it now, it should still, oh, it's still being picked up. You can still see because it's getting a little, oh, like, can I not, is it because I started it inside it? It won't stop. Does it stop? I think it stopped, right? Yeah, it stopped. It's gone. It's gone to normal. So now it's just a, a generic reflection. So it stopped taking reflections already. Uh, whereas if I put it back in, I think this is a threshold. There you go. You can see. You can see like, oh, you can see the the line there, right, where the bounding box is on the game view. If you look at that, you can kind of see the uh, the bounding box. So it's affecting everything in that in that bounding box. But as I go outside it, it stops affecting. All right, so that's um, that's how reflection probes work, and they are a very powerful way, especially if you don't need like perfect reflections. Um, they're a really powerful way of making things look much better because they reflect um, everything inside the reflection probe. Um, if you're doing something like a mirror, you probably don't want that. You probably want uh, screen space reflections. Um, I don't think we can do the lighting SSR, but I think we can do in post processing. There's a where is he? Reflection. Hmm. Doesn't allow me to do SSR. Okay. The current HDRP. I may need to edit the asset. So where is the HDRP asset? Um. I may need to edit it to allow SSRR. Are you pretty sure Unity project window? HDRP asset. So where's my asset? That, that's my asset. Okay, so the asset is basically like what overrides and controls everything in the project. You only need to mess with this once really. But I just want to see whether I need to enable so I can enable. I don't think it's going to allow me to enable GI. It's going to give out, I think. I've ticked it, but I don't know if it'll allow me because it, it'll probably it'll probably go like, no, you can't because you need um, you need ray tracing. But let's try that. We do allow volumetrics. Let's allow screen space reflection and let's allow transparency during that. So this affects the entire project, okay? Um, so let's go back to the post-process volume. Uh, cool, it's on. Uh, let's enable that. And this allows us to have real-time reflections. So where is my sphere again? So now my sphere should still reflect stuff, but just not as good once it's outside of the volume. Turn on, where's the post-process volume? Enable, um, smoothness, fade, start. I don't understand that picture. Mm, it's not, oh, it is, it is. You can see it working there. So it's outside of the bounding volume, but I don't know if you can still see that it is reflecting whatever like it's uh it's seeing, but it's not perfect, right? So it's not as good. It's it it won't be as good. You can see you can see it is reflecting. I'm outside the bounding box, but it's still reflecting stuff. Um, let me edit to see if I can change the smoothness fade start. Why can't I change this? Hmm, that's annoying. 
fade distance. Can I reduce that? Nope, doesn't seem to do much. You can see it reflecting there though, uh, but it's not as good as using a reflection probe. Um, it is real time, um, so it is like it will affect everything, but it's nowhere like when it goes back in, it's so much better. But when I go out, it still reflects, but it's just nowhere near as good. It's an approximation. Okay, so there's reasons to use one or the other. Most of the time, um, I think it's better to use reflection probes, even though they're, they're more effort to set up. They give a much better result. But sometimes you do need real-time stuff, and that's with SSRR. Let me try the GI and see what the GI works now. Oh, it does. Let me, let's find out. It probably won't do much, but let's see. Enable. Doesn't do anything. Yes. Quality. Can you tell any difference? I can't tell any difference. It's like one of those NVIDIA RTX on, RTX off. Sometimes you can't tell what's going on. So I can't, I can't tell anything. It's supposed to give me more bounces and stuff, but I can't really. Maybe when stuff is moving, I don't know. Not worth to me, anyway. Um, okay, cool. So is there any more in lighting? No, we don't need. We've got refraction. Um, screen, screen space refraction is good for if I have like a glass or transparent material and you kind of look through it and it's got a normal map on it it allows for refraction you can have you can have uh, refraction properties on hdrp materials as well um so you can do that now let's go look at the other stuff uh really what you're probably most interested well i can't do any ray tracing stuff unfortunately um can i do subsurface scattering i don't think i'll be able to anyway uh, Post-processing will be where most of the stuff you want to do. So Bloom is like the most common thing that people add, right? So Bloom is intensity. Whoopa. Everything goes shiny and pretty. So the threshold controls like how bright something has to be to Bloom. And then the intensity is like how intense it is. So you see the way when I increase my threshold, only like the the brighter stuff is blooming. So it controls like how much. It's especially good for... Um, like glows and stuff like that here. I don't know if you can tell. I don't know if you can kind of tell. It's like glowing a little bit around there. Um, and Bloom is like a very sci-fi thing as well. So if you have a, a kind of very sci-fi looking scene, slap a load of Bloom on it. Uh, let's put that light down. Where's that light? Okay, and then post process. It's very subtle for some reason in this. It should be brighter. Maybe if I look at the sun, it'll be more obvious. So I turn off the bloom. Nope. Oh, a little. Not really. I don't know if you can kind of see that, like, uh, the light kind of filters over the edges here. If I turn off the bloom, it's like, it's like occluded much better. But if you turn it back on, it's like it's glaring over, if that makes sense. It kind of like has a, a bleed across the edge. That's what Bloom does. Um, we can add more post-processing. So we've got color adjustments. Like all of these stuff are basically like how to shift. Um, so I can add more contrast. These are all like just little edits. You can see I'm adding way more contrast or I can reduce contrast um, to kind of give like a old school look. You can add a filter of it. This, this is kind of more color grading. Um, this is like a direct color filter over everything, so it's not a perfect color grading. Um, and you can add saturation, so like super bright, super black and white. Um, if you want proper color grading, you probably want to do something like the uh, channel mixer or the color curves. Uh, the channel mixer allows you like RGB, um, so controlling each channel. Let me remove this. Or the, I, I prefer the color curves. Uh, no, sorry, not the color curves. Oh yeah, it is. And then you can control like each, each individual, um, each individual color, um, like how it, how it's affected. Um, you can just do an overall color adjustment though, which is fine as well. Um, shadows, midtones, and highlights. Sorry, this is the one I prefer as well. Uh, much better actually. So we can control like in the shadows, like how bright or light they are and like they're they're kind of like color shift i don't know if you can see that so like i make like all the shadows shift to like green all the mid tones we can shift those to like pink and all the highlights you can brighten them and shift those to orange 
so you can kind of get like really funky looks um, with this and you can control each like so shadows obviously are the darker areas midtones are the middle and highlights are the lighter areas so you can individually control each one um, so you get quite a bit of granular control over there and it looks like really interesting um, Mind me of flashbacks in some games. A lot of games will use something like this to to go like, hey, dream environment, right? So they'll shift everything so it um, it just looks weird then. So film grain we looked at, depth of field is a bit complicated. So if we go to depth of field, uh, we can do either a physical cut. I prefer the manual. So the manual has like a start and an end range. So we can start and end. So literally start like, where do we start and where do we end? Let's edit further away. Can you see that? Can you see where the ending is happening? There we go. So look, this, there's a plane that you can control. Um, and it controls like where where the depth of field starts and where it ends. I don't know if you can see that moving slowly. And it basically allows you to like um, add focus. So like certain areas out of out of focus and in focus the physical camera is better um it has a more realistic look but it's a lot more awkward to mess with um and then let's go to lens distortion is pretty easy um i think that's pretty clear lens distortion is literally just like um oh intensity do you just like distorting lens so again like if i wanted a, a really um for example if i wanted this to look like an old school camera when i went to this volume do something like that like maybe a security camera i would probably let me turn off the shadows midtones i'd probably drop saturation uh like a little i'd probably do a color filter to shift it to a camera would probably be kind of like maybe let's do like a bluey bluey color like a little shift that we would do a film grain pretty intense film grain and then we would do a chromatic aberration intensity uh, and i would probably also put some lines across the screen or something but that looks um that looks a lot more like a you know like i'm looking through a security camera can you actually do an effect where and the ice where everything is basically that lighting, but one item is different. Okay. So, like courthouse. Uh, so like the the if the post processing affects everything except one thing. Yeah. So like an item is the normal color, while everything else is the color of the scene. So I would probably use a shader for that personally, but yes, you can. Now, I don't remember exactly here off the top of my head, but I think what you would do is you would have on the camera a culling mask um, and you would use maybe a second camera um, that's linked to the main camera. There's a few ways. You could do a second camera linked to the main camera and you only render, you do a two render passes. So one render pass is the main camera and then the second camera only renders this, the other stuff. You could probably do a... I should be able to do a post-processing override. I just don't know where it is. So like the post-process only affects, uh, doesn't affect everything. I would need to look at that actually, to be honest with you, Kian. I don't know off the top of my head. Oh, um, HRP, Unity, um, layers, volume layer maybe. Okay, one volume which only affects UI. That seems to be similar to what we want to do. Do, 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 do. Oh, okay, yeah, so you do need to change the render pass. Okay, so you can do it. It's a bit bit much of a... It seems to this, anyway, to be a little annoying. Um, if you want to do it, it looks like you can. Volume layer mass. Can we do that? Do, 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 do. Yeah, so supposedly there's a layer mask in here that we can... This is global, so it won't work. But if if I do a local, supposedly there is a layer mask, so you should be able to mask off different layers. So, uh, depending on the physics layer, some things on the phys on physics layers that are not affected won't be uh, won't won't have post processing affect them. Supposedly, according to what I've just read there. 
okay. Yeah. So it seems like there's a way to do it. I haven't done it myself, to be honest with you, and I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much like there's a few other things. Tone mapping would be kind of a big one as well. Uh, tone mapping in this case would generally take a texture, um, or you can use like different types of tone mapping here. Um, so like it's just how it renders basically, and you can have a lookup texture. It's confusing stuff. So if you don't know what you're doing, you don't really need to use it. Um, you can generally get most of the way there. This is kind of look for pretty pretty hardcore stuff. So this is the basics of post processing in HDRP. It's not that difficult really, especially if you come uh, if you set up a project that's already set up. All you need to do is sky and fog volume and post process volume, and you can tweak the um, the post processing profile. Now the other thing I wanted to cover today should we take a little break because it is eleven. We take a little five minute break. I know you already had one when I had to go, but a little five, 10 minute break. I don't have that much left to cover today. It'll be materials really. Okay, so uh, let's go to materials. So if I go look, click on this material, which I just made real quick there, you can see that the, oh, sorry. So this is slightly different um, from the usual standard shaders. Um, so you're, you, you're probably used to standard shaders. HDRP lit shaders, um, lit meaning it will take lighting, are slightly different. So we can change whether it's opaque or transparent. Uh, we can change the rendering pass, meaning like when it's rendered, like uh, by default, it's usually just sat on the default. Uh, cull mode is like it, whether it culls stuff behind it or not. Uh, we can change whether it's double-sided um, and then whether it is like subsurface scattering material um, I, if I turn this off this is gonna explode uh, let me try uh, no not too bad so subsurface scattering I don't know if you can tell let me turn off all the post-process volume weird stuff off 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 and off and color adjustments off so subsurface scattering, um, so I can see it pretty clearly, I don't know if you can, uh, is basically where the material lets a little bit of light inside it and then diffuses it. So it kind of looks a bit like jade almost. Um, so let me control the thickness of it. Will that control it? Uh, I should have a mask, but I don't have one. Um, so it kind of controls, the, I, I don't know if you can see it very lightly letting light go through it and then like bounce off it. It's like a little bit, if I look at the edge, it's slightly transparent. So uh, if you think of like stuff like jade, like jelly, uh, like skin, they all use subsurface scattering. Um, but the standard, uh, we can also do iridescence, which I don't know if that'll, yeah, that works pretty well. Um, I don't know, you can see like it's got like different bands of colors there. So this is like um, like oil or um, uh, oil or like um, if you have one of those beetles that are kind of shiny, this is what iridescence will allow you to do. And you can mask it. There's a mask down here as well. Um, you can add normal map for that. Um, this is much better actually. This used to be very slow when we, we swapped that. But most of the time you're probably, ooh, let me try translucent. I think that's new. Ooh, ooh, okay. Cool, there we go. So translucent seems to be very similar to subsurface scattering. Um, very similar. Can I control the thickness? Does it do anything? Does it really? Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, but most of the time you'll be using standard, okay? And with standard, what you're probably gonna wanna do is add like your usual maps, right? Your normal maps and blah, 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 all that stuff. Now, here's where it gets weird. Look down here, we have a base map. That's your albedo map. Let's set that to white. So this is your albedo map. We do have a metallicity and we do have a smoothness. Okay, so that's fine. But then we have the weird thing called a mass map. Okay, so what a mass map does is um, every image, um, every RGB image has a red, green, and blue channel. So let me just show you. If I draw something on blue, and I draw something on green, and I draw something on red. The RGB is like the intersection of all of those, okay? And depending on the intensity of each one of those. Um, and they're like black and white in each channel, 
what a mass map will do is in because usual images take each channel like RGB and the alpha for like transparency. So usual images will take a red channel, blue, green channel, blue channel, and use that all together to um, to create a a a, a, a full color image. Uh, what a mass map does is it's like well that's a waste because a normal map only really use uh, sorry a not a normal map a um, a metallicity map only uses grayscale it's only gray and white a um, the same with an occlusion map the same with like a, the, a there's a lot of maps if you remember that we were working with last week last semester that only use black and white and each of these channels only use black and white so if we can somehow make an image that like the red channel is used for example for the uh, occlusion and then the green channel is used for like metallicity and then maybe the blue channel is used for like something else um we can just be cheap about the, the map and just have this one mass map hold a bunch of different maps and that's basically what a mass map is now in substance happily we don't need to do that stuff we can just tell it to do it ourselves so let's try let me grab the bastion yeah whatever and let me try to export this for hdrp you should be able to see oh great not responding Cool. Yes, can I? File. Export textures. Uh, let's export to asset design. New folder. Should be HDRP. And we'll export in there. And instead of using the usual, sorry, I'm trying to make this smaller. There we go. So instead of using the usual template, we're going to try to use output template for Unity HDRP, HD render pipeline metallic standard. And now we can see that it's going to give me a mass map, base map, mass map, normal map, and emissive map. Cool. So then we can export that. Cool. Perfect. So let's export it. If I go back to Unity, and let's import those assets. Do, 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 here. Oh, and I need the model. So working. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So base map goes there. It's basically the same as an albedo map. Great stuff. And then it's just like uh, the mass map just goes in there. And oops. Yeah. There we go. 
just took a while to calculate. And then the normal map goes in the normal map area. Cool. It's pretty good. Um, it looks much better here, by the way, than the uh, than if you remember in the other in the other um, <clears throat> in the normal scene that we put this in. Uh, we don't have a bet normal map or a coat mass. We can ignore those usually. And if I need an emission, I need to go all the way down here and I need to turn on use emission intensity. Um, I can use a direct emission color, or in this case, I have an emission map, so I'll put that in there. Takes a little while. And I may need to swap this is, to. Sorry. Is you, the Unity. What's that? You're, you're not. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, is the Unity. Please, big. Can you keep cutting in and out? I'm not sure if that's just for me, but. Uh, sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, is the Unity scene all character very big? Is the Unity scene what very big? Oh, one second. Um, uh, I can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. No, I was wondering, is the Unity scene very small, or is the character just very big? I don't know. It's probably my character is very big. I I don't think I made it with proper scale. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's probably huge. I don't know. I'm sure the Unity scene is fine, but I kind of like it being huge. So you know, you get what you get. So there we go. There's our huge Bastion. Um. And you can see like the, the normal mass working, everything's working, and like it's actually pretty good um, and runs pretty well. So I don't know if you noticed while I was while you were asking that question, but I changed the I find it's better on it's usually on nits. Um, but I usually find it's better on EV hundred and then you need you usually need to tweak the emission intensity to actually make it glow. But it is glowing on the um, on the on that area. You can multiply it with the base color. So like whatever the actual base color is. Um, so if I turn that off, why doesn't it turn off? Oh. Uh, with the base color will multiply with the emission itself, or you don't have to do that. So you can kind of see that we have that little gloom, uh, bloom, sorry, and it glows properly as it should, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, yeah. So that is the materials. I don't think there's too much more you need to know with this. You can kind of ignore most of the other stuff. Uh, there's a detail map, the same as you you have for normal texturing. Um, and you can tile down here. You can offset down here the same as usual. Um, double-sided you can use. So like the normal standard material, you, like it's quite hard to do double-sided with the normal standard material, but you can with this. Um, and if you want transparency, you may need to swap it to transparent. Cool. Any questions on that material stuff before? No? Okay. And the final thing we need to talk about is basically particle effects. So you can use normal particle effects in here. They do work. Um, you may want to use a VFX graph if you want to do like some really complex particle effects because they're GPU bound as opposed to CPU bound. So normal particle effects will use your CPU and um, VFX graph will use your GPU. So it just depends uh, whether you have a GPU and whether you have um, whether you have like something that needs it. Um, so for a VFX graph, you would create a visual effect, and it's here. It's you then need to make a visual effect asset. So let's just make one in the assets folder. So create a visual effects asset. Visual effects, visual effects graph, and then like this VFX graph is literally what goes into that VFX here, so you can just like drag it in, so it's gonna play that. This is probably playing, yeah, just just the default VFX graph. Um, so you can see it's like pretty much like the default particle system, right? Um, if I open this up, I get the VFX graph, which takes a while. Um, and it's very similar to the old school particle system. So there's a lot in here. I don't think I'll be able to cover all of it. But if you, I will, so literally the tutorial, which I'll post into the chat now, 
is probably the best intro that you can have, to be honest. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that one, not Brocky's one. And Brocky's one is old. Yeah. Poor Brocky's. That's Brocky's as well. Yeah, okay. So this is a good intro. It's literally just a VFX graph. Um, and you can get started with the, literally just like a demo. Um, but essentially what you do is, so you have this update, right? Update happens like uh, what hap You add things like called blocks. So you can like create a block and you can give it like a, you can give it, Uh, attributes sorry so here's the spawn rate so like how how much it spawns here's the velocity for each component um, and then when you output by default it outputs a quad and a quad is just like you know a you know what a quad is it's just what one um, square polygon basically um, and then whether it's using alpha clipping or not so whether it has alpha blended um, whether it's additive meaning like it like so if I click it to additive I don't know if you can see it's gonna like it's gonna add to the background, so it's gonna blend with the background a little more. So that's kind of good for stuff that's uh, that will brighten the background. Uh, we can control size over life. So if I do this, you should be able to see this change straight away. So it's basically the same as a particle system, right? And if I if I want more stuff, I can just like create block. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. Generally, you'd be looking at like um, attributes. So you can do like a curve, and you can do like a Let's do a, let's do a size over life, maybe. Oh no, I already have a size over life. Oops. Delete. So create a block attribute curve. Let's do like a, Do I have an alpha over life? I don't. Let's do an alpha over life. So yeah, so it's going to start with no transparency, go up to maximum transparency, and then go back down to zero. So if I look at that here, does that work? Yeah, you can see it. And it goes down to zero. It starts with nothing, goes back up, and goes down to zero. So that's kind of how you would add stuff. So it's a little more complicated than the particle system because the particle system comes with everything already made. Um, whereas with this, you kind of need to sometimes go through the blocks and figure out what you actually want. Um, but it is a lot more powerful. It allows me to add like quite a bit more particles in the particle system. And it also blends them much better than it would the normal particle system. Um, why isn't that spawning more? Oh, capacity is low. Do, 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 do. There we go. So you can see I can get like, this is like thousands. And it's fine. You know, it's running pretty well. Not a problem. Uh, whereas with a normal, oh, no, small, small problems. But with a normal particle system, I would be running into issues already. All right. Because this is, uh, this is now offloaded, hopefully should be offloaded to my GPU to calculate instead of my CPU. So any questions on all that? This is basically everything to do with HDRP, more or less everything you need to do with HDRP. Um, we haven't gone over timeline stuff. Fully. We, we kind of had a little overview, so we can have a little look at the timeline stuff as well. Um, for next week, what I wanted was your animatics. So if anyone remember that? So your animatics. Yeah, but I think I'm going to just change mine because... It's up to you. I don't think I can do the water thing. No, it was next week, Maddie. if you remember. I was like, um, well, I did change my mind, to be fair. But I was kind of like, I, I might um, I might do HDRP stuff this week instead. So that's another animatic as well. So you're literally just like, um, if you have any music, if you have any sounds, if you have anything, you would like sync it to the storyboards that you have. Um, and usually when you do that, you want to make sure that the, the correct hammer angles are used, uh, the correct kind of like, if you're using audio, the correct audio is used. Um, and then you're trying to get the timing down correctly. Okay, so that's what an automatic would be. Cool. Oh, 
How much for animatics? How much movement do you want? Do I don't, you want there's no of, like again. This is your like third the, year. Do you want the choppy? Do you want the choppy?